Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Shrug Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing two separate pieces of news. The first of which pertains to AMD's Radeon Vega Frontier Edition. This is the graphics card on the Vega lineup, of course, aimed at professionals. Now, rather interestingly, this card has been listed on two separate retailers with two separate SKUs. So we have information regarding the specifications, we have yet further information regarding performance, and also some information regarding pricing. We'll get into that in a moment. And then we're going to finalize the video with Intel and the Skylake X and the Skylake SP mesh architecture, which is very similar to AMD's Infinity Fabric. One could say it's a semi-direct response. The basic premise here is that it features higher efficiency, better bandwidth, and lower latency, but we'll go into that in just a moment. So let's start out with AMD since they are the first, as usual, alphabetically. This information actually did pop up on a couple of different uh, websites including the usuals of reddit and so on but i originally found it on videocards.com so i'm going to credit them so anyway two vega cards have appeared in listings on both scan uk and saber pc now there are two distinct skus the first is an air cooled version and the second is a liquid version the interesting thing, however, is the pricing. We'll go further into this in just a moment, but I'll give you the brief synopsis. It's 1800 US dollars or 1656 Great British Pounds for the liquid, whereas the air cooled version is 1200 US dollars or 1140 Great British Pounds. Now, here's where things get a bit complicated, and that's putting it somewhat mildly. If one was to take a look at the performance details, you can see that the peak pre single precision and half precision is essentially identical. You're looking at 13.1 teflops or 26.2 for half precision, which obviously makes an awful lot of sense. But if you were to take a look at, let's say, the Sabre PC listings, as far as I can see, the scan listings are now defunct. They've been taken away. I imagine that they kind of was like, ah! Run away! Fix it! But anyway, um, there is no actual, I, there is no difference basically between the two cards other than the cooler. Well, at least on the surface. I'll get into that in just a second, but let's have a brief rundown of the specs. So you've got 16 gigabytes of memory, 14, sorry, 4, 000, 400, excuse me, in 83 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, 4096 stream processors. Same number of shaders, same core clock, and all of that stuff is identical. The core clock, by the way, has actually been confirmed on scan to be 1600 megahertz, but for some reason or another, that's not listed on Sabre PC, but I digress. So basically, the two parts are identical, except the cooler. At least, from what we can gather, the difference is the cooler. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I don't know if it's something else perhaps it has better overclocking potential perhaps it has higher quality silicon perhaps i don't know maybe it it, it boosts higher um, i don't know but it's it's a lot of money basically you're looking at like basically 500 pounds for the liquid version of a card which i'll be really blunt takes the piss um you can do your own googling on how much a liquid cooler costs if you so desire, but let's just be honest, we all know it's not worth that amount of cash, like £500 or whatever it is in your regional currency equivalent. That is absolutely bloody ludicrous. So I want to see the reviews, I want to see why the hell it costs that amount of cash, because there's absolutely no other differences. You're looking at the same ports, the same connections, the same TDP, everything is identical. Um, so I really want to know what's going on there. It I don't like that because to me it sets kind of a dangerous precedent for pricing. Another example as well is AMD have also once again shown off the various performance numbers against Nvidia's Titan XP, which of course is based upon Pascal. Now in many examples they are quite considerably ahead. In Cinebench they're only around 8% advantage, where in others they're around 70% advantage, 26% advantage, 40% advantage. In other words, it's significant. The problem I have with this is that most of those are highly compute um, sensitive applications and Titan XP, as many of you probably are aware, isn't actually designed for that. It's more, you know, the, the consumer who perhaps wants to 
focus mostly on gaming and really Nvidia have an entire lineup of graphics cards which I feel that AMD should have instead pitted Vega against. As a slight aside, do remember that this is Vega Frontier Edition. This is not RX Vega. And I'm still getting some confusion on that when people are looking at the videos. Now, what we understand from Raja Kadori, and obviously he's working for AMD, so perhaps he's not exactly, you know, an unbiased source, but from what we understand, Frontier Edition is specifically geared towards professionals, so video editing and whatever else. In other words, it's not really designed for playing Tomb Raider. That's not to say you can't do it. Raja has pointed out, yes, you can do it. I mean, most of the demos that have been running supposedly are running Vega Frontier Edition, but from what he said, you get better results with the RX Vegas. And from what he's hinted at, this is mostly due to drivers and some other optimizations on the hardware. What those optimizations are, it's a mystery because he hasn't gone into those details, which I don't kind of like. I, I wish there were more forthcoming at this point because with how close the graphics cards are, I, I feel that this is the point where, to be really honest, it's getting a bit ridiculous. Um, I feel that Vega should, at this point, just be, you know, there should be review samples kind of floating around because it's just it's been out for so long. And I do wish that AMD, at the various events they had, hadn't been so cagey. I wish they had shown off more examples of different cards. You know, AMD have had multiple demo booths available and, you know, they've shown off stuff before. At this point, though, I do wish that they would show off with a greater degree of applications, with more games, perhaps with more wider variety of um, usage and test scenarios, because at this point, it's very hard for anyone to know whether it's worth jumping onto the, onto the Vega bandwagon. And I, I do feel that their expectations now are so varied, like everyone has expectations. And I do mean pretty much whether you're even slightly into tech or whether you know you're pretty much at the point where you're building a new PC I've had people writing to me in comments and you can see themselves on other websites as well and they'll be like you know Vega is going to be anything from slightly slower than Pascal all the way to it's going to be 50% faster it's, it's getting a little ludicrous at this point but I digress I'm going to not bother to go through the rest of the specifications which are very much well known at this point for example the fact that it has um, the high bandwidth cache control and all of this stuff because we've said it multiple times so for this video I'm just going to go into the new stuff. Speaking of which, let's jump into Intel. So Skylake X and Skylake SP have a very interesting reveal that isn't necessarily the number of cores or anything like that, instead it's something more low level. The reason I find this rather exciting is because it is going to become part, once again, of the high-end desktop lineup with the Skylake X. So, currently, you may be aware that a lot of Intel's CPUs don't have a large number of processor cores. A CPU, of course, at its heart, is about one thing, processing data. Data is sent around the computer at various points it could be going to caches it could be sent from one core stored in a cache and then another core process it it could be going to a chunk of memory for example a result of one plus one could be grabbed from sorry the math of one plus one could be grabbed from memory the result obviously being two that would be sent back to perhaps a cache then that result which we'll just call a will be merged with another result of b that math would then be wrote back into main system memory you get the idea so because Intel's ring architecture, ring bus, was put back in the late 2007 or 8, I'm not exactly sure now to be honest with you, it is a little archaic. It doesn't quite match up to what you'd expect in a modern day processor. I'm going to keep this fairly simple just for the sake of this video because I don't want this to be a super long video, but basically if you were to take something like Broadwell, also known as a low core count CPU, allows data to be sent from one core to another core, but requires a single cycle. So if one core is close in proximity to another core, in other words, it's right next to it, one cycle will send that data to one to that core. The problem becomes, however, if a core is multiple cores away. So for example, if it's all the way at the bottom of the stack, I guess is the best way of describing all the way at the top, then it may take several cycles to do it. In fact, at worst, it could take 12 cycles. 
And so the ability to move data in either direction does help, but it doesn't necessarily fix the issue. This is particularly true when you start taking cash into, a, uh, into account as well. Do you remember in many instances, data is held in cash, which is actually relative to that core. For example, level one. Intel's mesh, however, is very, 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 very different. Instead, you can think of it as having multiple, several vertical and horizontal connections. And these connect cores, cache, memory controls, and of course, the PCI Express. In other words, all of the I.O. is connected, memory controlled and all that jazz. What Intel have basically done here is simply multiply the, multiply, excuse me, the amount of on-die communications. This increases bandwidth, but also delivers low latency. Another benefit, in theory at least, obviously we're going to have to wait for testing, is that temperatures should be slightly lower. Because not only can you use lower clock rates for those, if necessary, but you can also lower the voltage and still keep the latency quite low and enjoy higher bandwidth. In theory, another benefit should be that you should get better yields and you should be able to put chips together in a much simpler manner. In an ideal world, this will eventually help Intel to bring down the cost of its higher core count processors. I'm not saying this will happen. Personally, I feel that if Intel get a pretty good kicking from AMD, let's say for the sake of argument, they notice that their share in the market starts to diminish, then assuming they start getting some good yields on these chips, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing uh, some drastic price cuts in Intel's future. But obviously, we just don't know that. Considering that we're seeing things such as, you know, the Optane SSDs and we're seeing the push for Intel to increase the speed of networking and obviously multiple core, um, sorry, multiple processor configurations. So you've got two or whatever processors actually in the same system. And obviously with increased memory speeds as well, with a huge amount of IO overhead, especially if you're doing, let's say, graphics processing as well. All of this stuff makes an awful lot of sense. As for whether you should jump on a base end falls, also known as Skylake X, also known as X299, also known as Intel's answer in the HEDT arena, or whether you should jump on Threadripper, unfortunately that's not going to be self-evident for a couple of weeks at least. And personally, if you don't need to jump on a platform, I wouldn't even jump on it for a couple of months. Like I would wait for about two months after their launch. Why? Because at that point, you're going to get a nice sample size of what the best boards are. You're going to know what the best processor is for the money. You're going to have BIOS revisions, which is no doubt going to improve performance, which, by the way, is another thing I need to do with AMD's uh, B350 and X370 platforms. I need to do a, an update for you all and, I guess, a... Uh, 1.0.0.6 he wants to say or is it 0.8 I can't remember my brain's fried at this point um yeah it's 0.8 I think but anyway I digress so all of that stuff plus of course you've got the other things such as like you're going to know better what software responds better to high numbers of cores versus higher clock speeds you know perhaps prices are going to settle down a little bit as well how memory speeds are going to impact one platform or another in other words we're going to know a lot more stuff but that said if you're itching to buy a certain certain platform then just go with the one of course that probably suits your budget more but if budget isn't the primary concern and instead you want the best thing for your cash then I would always advise waiting for both products to be out and then you can probably go from there. This is especially true if you've got a fairly nice system anyway, like you've got a Broadwell E or whatever. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.